On July 4, 2010, in Oakland, California, a 19-year-old male suffered one of the most brutal injuries when it comes to the iconic Independence holiday. Fireworks can be a dangerous thing, but this takes the disclaimer to a whole new level. The next animation was inspired by the incident. Here is a dramatized version of the event. I was more than ready to move out to join the Marines, and for as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to serve my country. But when my buddies found out that I had planned to become part of an elite fighting force, they invited me to a party on the 4th of July, to which I said in a snap, Of course, count me in. Just remember not to go empty-handed, okay? One of my friends urged, his lips curling into a baleful grin. I think I know what you mean. I reciprocated delightfully. So, when they asked me about fireworks, I recommended something I had always wanted to try, but never got the chance to use when I was much younger. What about we go for the M1000? I said proudly. And what the hell is that? My friend Jake asked. I heard it's better than most fireworks. Besides, you wanted a show, right? It's the 4th of July. Might as well use a good one. I winked back at him. All right, bring two of them then. Brian pushed even further. Yes, it was malicious. However, before entering the censorious world of Marines, I thought it would be best to have some fun. All right, guys, let's do this, I said with conviction. When I entered the convenience store to buy some drinks, I noticed some of the lame fireworks on display near the glass windows and approached them, thinking, what the hell? Only seven or ten-year-olds would buy these. Of course, I already knew beforehand that I wouldn't be able to find any good fireworks at a corner shop. So, I put the fireworks back on the stand and immediately left with the beverages I bought, walking down the street until I noticed this creepy old dude on the other side of the road. He wore a blue bomber jacket and a cap, his smile sinister and his eyes fixated on me, almost hypnotic. So, I admit that I was freaked out, especially when he urged me to come closer like one of those people on the news who were next to a vehicle and were instantly abducted. I gulped, feeling a bit anxious, but it felt wrong to be presumptuous. So, I remained vigilant as I approached the car, thinking that he was probably those individuals that held garage sales within their vehicles, based on what I was seeing. So, what's up? I asked casually, relaxing my shoulders, hoping he wouldn't notice how edgy I was deep inside. You're perfect! You're just the guy I was looking for, and I'm just the guy you need! His eyes grew more prominent with a look of anticipation in them. Puzzled, I wondered what he was referring to, because he wasn't making any sense. So, as he pointed to the trunk of his car, all the gold and diamonds shimmered before my very eyes. Well, just to clarify, there weren't actual gold and diamonds. But to me, it was a treasure trove, filled with M80s, M150s, M1000s, and M2000s. So, at that moment, all my trepidation had vanished and I was ecstatic. Well, what do you think, big guy? He asked, his eyes glimmering with euphoria. How did you know I was looking for fireworks? I inquired, raising an eyebrow. It's almost the 4th of July, he said teasingly. Then, moments later, his smile grew more protuberant as he laughed in a rumbustious manner, saying, I'm just messing with you. I saw you checking out those lame fireworks by the window at the corner store. Relieved that he wasn't a kidnapper, I continued to pursue the items and opted to buy two M1000s as my friends and I initially agreed upon. How much for the M1000? I asked, hoping it would be worth the price. Well, originally I'd sell it for 20, but if you want to buy two of them, I'd be happy to give you each for just 10. I contemplated for a moment and thought it would be a lot riskier to order online, so I took the offer and closed the deal. Dude, you sure these are good? Like, are they properly manufactured? Yes, of course! And all that zeal was quickly replaced by chagrin. Are you questioning my credibility as a salesman? I've been selling these babies for 13 years now! I had no intention of entering into a conflict, so I simply apologized and thought of buying one of the larger ones in addition to the M1000s. Then I sent photos of them to my friends, and they all responded with excitement. The following day, we enjoyed the party, and it was a blast with the cool DJ, bouncy houses, alcohol, and the myriad of people who came to the backyard. However, the most exhilarating part was lying in a box, just waiting to explode at the right moment. 
While the others were busy drinking and dancing to the beat, I began setting up the fireworks as my friends and acquaintances cheered for me. The large one was positioned at the center, while the two smaller M1000s were taped, one on each side. It was time to light it up. So, using a lighter, it was set aflame. All eyes were on me now, as we waited for the moment it would shoot up into the air and burst in this spectacular amalgamation of colors. However, a few minutes later, nothing happened, and the collective ecstasy of everyone gathered to see the fireworks display evaporated into thin air, filling me with <laughs> immense pressure. So, to save face, I blew out the fire and approached the fireworks against the advice of my friends not to. I paid for this, all right? And I'll do whatever it takes to make it work," I said distressfully, to which all the other people cheered for me again. As I came closer to inspect the fireworks, I made sure to create a distance to avoid unnecessary accidents, noticing that everything seemed to be in place and nothing was particularly wrong with them. So I lit it up once more, but was unaware that my arm was close to the wick. <gasps> it happened so fast that I didn't even have the time to react. As soon as they exploded, a powerful force pushed me back, and all I could hear was the incessant high-pitched tone ringing in my ears, slowly diminishing as time passed. When I rose from the ground, my friends stared and screamed, and that's when I saw it, one of my hands completely obliterated. <laughs> My friend Jake yelled. I told you not to get too close! My heart racing, I replied. Help! Please! Somebody call the cops! Everyone else panicked as the fireworks went all over the place, causing injuries on the legs, arms, and face. Then, moments later, they all died down and we were brought to the nearest hospital, where I had to ponder on my actions and regret for the rest of my life that I had lost my hand and that now, I would forever lose my marine dreams. Now, investigators are looking into reports that fireworks were going off before the flames broke out. A fire that took off and moved fast at about 3.30 Sunday morning. More than 100 firefighters came from across the city the next story was inspired by a fatal incident in Northeast Portland that caused two entire complex buildings to burn down. You can imagine the 4th of July blaze being a horrific sight for those that resided there. The next animation was inspired by the tragic occurrence. During my freshman year of college, I lived in the student dorms on campus. I had pretty good luck with my boarding buddy my first year, but it wasn't until he packed up and left to go home for the summer that things took an unfortunate turn. I would have gone home for the summer as well, but I spent most of my first year in college going out and partying and staying up late. And while I managed to keep my grades in check during the fall semester, I failed three out of four of my classes during the spring semester. This meant I had to retake all those classes during the summer, which for many reasons was not ideal in the slightest. But it wasn't just missing out on going home to party with my old friends from high school that made me regret my decisions. It was who moved in after my other roommate. You see, during the summer, most people go home, and college towns like the one I lived in turn into ghost towns until things pick back up again. My dorm hall in particular was almost completely abandoned, so you can imagine my confusion when I was notified by automatic email that I would be getting a new roommate. Part of me was glad I wouldn't be spending the summer alone, but very quickly I realized I'd rather be alone. Right away I began to wish I was. April was barely over when I first arrived at my door. The first thing I noticed about him was his height. He had to duck his head just to get in through the door. But despite being unreasonably tall for his age, he was stick thin. His proportions were almost inhuman, like he was Slender Man in human form. And when he walked into the room, I also noticed that instead of a backpack or a suitcase, he carried all of his belongings in a huge duffel bag. Which, by the way, his spine curved to the side of his body on which he was carrying it looked to be extremely heavy. On top of everything else, the semblance of conversation he was able to hold was just as awkward. Hey, nice to meet you. I'm Parker. I guess you're my roommate for the summer? No, I'm just transferring. I didn't fit in at my last school, but hopefully things will be different here. Do you celebrate the 4th of July? Uh, yeah, man. I bet there'll be some good parties around then. 
Oh, that's just what I was hoping for. You're the perfect candidate for my celebration plans. It's gonna be a blast! <laughs> cool, man. I dig the energy. So, uh, what's in the bag? Oh, you know, just books and stuff. Alright, well make yourself at home and uh, I got some beers in the fridge. At the time, the 4th of July was still a couple months away. I never encountered anyone so preemptively excited about that particular holiday. But even though I found that to be strange, his fixation on the 4th was not the weirdest thing about him at all. I never once saw him get up to use the bathroom or take a shower. I never saw him leave the room to go to class. And I can't remember a conversation with him that didn't end up on the subject of the 4th of July. It was like he was lying in wait, totally dormant until that date finally arrived, which seemed to be all he cared about. The only thing that kept me from thinking this guy was a robot or something was that he did seem to read a lot and study for his classes. Of course, he didn't do either of those things like a normal human being would either. Because no matter what he was doing, he would never stop staring at me. When I tried to study on my bed, he would climb onto the foot of it and sit there without asking, crossing his legs and sticking his face into a book. Uh, dude, I'm not trying to be rude, but I need my space. This is my study zone. I need to focus. Oh, don't worry about me. I won't bother you. Just pretend I'm not even here. I tried to be cool about it, but it was hard to handle his constant gaze. He'd sit across from me with a tiny little book and hold it really far away from his face with his long spindly arms. So I knew he could see me around the edges of the book. It all gave me the creeps, but I did my best to ignore him. I didn't want to confront him because I was worried he would snap. Eventually, I couldn't handle it anymore. I started spending entire days away from the dorm, studying in the library and going on walks through the campus. I told my roommate that I needed to focus on studying really hard because I wouldn't be able to retake those classes again. And while that was true, I really just wanted to get away from him. Worst of all, he never slept. He would just lie awake at night like a chronic insomniac. Every night in bed, I could feel his eyes on me from across the room, wide and unblinking. Just ten more days until the 4th of July, Rumi. Just ten more days. I played possum, pretending I was asleep most of the time. He was so excited about the holiday that he interrupted my sleep one night with a thunderous countdown. Five, four, three, two, one... Happy 4th of July! <laughs> Dude, what the hell is wrong with you? It's three in the morning! I'm just rehearsing! <laughs> I began to lose endless nights of sleep. Not because I was sharing in his restless anticipation, but from a terrible sense of dread of what his plans were for that day. On the night of July 3rd, my nerves were just about shot. I was getting ready to go to bed for a night of fitful sleep when I noticed my roommate was actually in the bathroom taking a shower. I'd never once seen or heard him take a shower, so I figured I'd get more insight on what his preparations for the next day were. Even though it was risky, I knew I'd never get another chance, so I took the opportunity to look through his belongings. First, I opened up some of the books that he had out, and that's when I felt sick to my stomach. Every single notebook was empty, and every supposed reading assignment completely unannotated. Then, I unzipped his duffel bag, and the only thing in it, and I mean the only thing, was a collection of highly illegal fireworks, cherry bombs, mortars, flares, every kind of recreational explosive you could possibly think of, and not one change of clothes or a toothbrush. I put everything back into its place and crept back into my bed, fully aware at that point that the person I'd been living with was no student. He was a complete psycho with other plans altogether. I knew I had to get the hell out of there, but I pretended to be asleep while trying to formulate an escape plan. Unfortunately, all the sleep I lost in the weeks prior caught up to me, so I passed out with the intentions of leaving first thing the next morning. I woke up later to the sound of explosions perforating my eardrums. I scrambled in confusion, half asleep in daze by the concussive blast and disoriented by the screeching wails of the fire alarm. In the middle of the room, I saw my roommate holding a fistful of sparklers in one hand and Roman candles in the other, with an array of mortars and rockets lined up at his feet, set up with a network of fuses which were already lit and sending 20-foot fireballs into the confined space of the dorm room. There was a wicked smile on his face and all over the other deafening sounds. I could still hear him laughing like never before. Happy 4th of July, Rumi! <laughs> Leave me alone, I'm calling the cops! The room was full of sparks and fire. I jumped out of bed and ran through the chaos, rockets hitting me on the back of the head and flying across my face the entire way. But I made it out through the door. From there, I ran outside to safety. I had to leave all my belongings behind. And in the end, 
It all became scorched in the fire that he started. The same fire that reduced my room to ashes had ended up killing him. Thankfully, the fire only spread to a few other unoccupied rooms. The investigator said that he managed to disable the sprinklers in our room. That was probably what he was doing in the bathroom. They said they found him still holding onto his fireworks, with a permanent smile melted onto his face. The next animation is loosely based on a case in Wisconsin that happened around the 4th of July of 2021. What went down was pretty tragic, but nonetheless a shocking tale to be shared to the world. It's been a day since my parents left the house to visit our family's cabin in White Lake, Wisconsin for the 4th of July. The last time I ever saw them and spoke to them was before they left in their Honda Civic. Since then, I haven't been able to hear from them, which I thought was quite strange. This wasn't the first time they'd been to the cabin, so based on past experiences, they'd contact me within two to three hours. However, this time around, I hadn't received a call from them or a single text telling me how they were doing. So, as 24 hours passed, I began to sweat profusely, feeling a bit anxious. Hey, stop being so paranoid, I told myself, as I sat on the couch watching my favorite rom-com on HBO. Then, moments later, my heart skipped a beat, and my entire body went cold within seconds, even if it was in the middle of summer. Turning off the television, thoughts of my parents getting into an accident or being robbed by hitchhikers consumed me. No matter what I did, I couldn't shake off the feeling of despair. On the second day, I tried calling them again, but still no response. So my hands would constantly fidget as I dialed the numbers. <sighs> Calm down, Alvin. I thought to myself. You're imagining things again, and sometimes you go way out of line. Later on, I contacted my relatives to see if they could shed some light. However, to my dismay, they had not received any message from my parents for the last couple of hours. Lost in agony, I sat alone at the dining table, heedless of the bowl of tomato soup left untouched as I gazed blankly into the void. I began talking to myself, saying, Thanks for the soup, Mom. Your cooking's the best in the world. And as I poured myself a glass of water, I added, Do you want a bottle of beer, Dad? I can get one from the fridge. The water overspilled, blanketing the floor. Then what started as anxiety slowly turned to rage. As I glanced at the empty chairs, I couldn't go to work. My thoughts overthrown by the nagging feeling that something terrible had already happened. So, while I was taking a shower, I would stay in the tub for hours, allowing the water to flow constantly as I stared at the ceiling, wondering, what happened to those two? Did they reach the cabin? Where the hell are they? Then, as I went to bed, I would hear screams in the middle of the night, keeping me up until the wee hours of the morning. It sounded much like my parents, but as soon as I turned on the lights, no one was there. So, like a nightmare that I had to wash away, I would lock myself in the bathroom, splashing water on my face. Then, glancing at myself in the mirror, I would draw a deranged smile, telling myself, This is nothing. Why am I being so foolish? They're, they're probably having so much fun that they, they forgot to check their phones. That, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Moments later, those rosy cheeks were bathed in salty tears as I maintained a forceful grin, but nothing worked. All this psychobabble wasn't getting me anywhere. Frustrated, I slammed the door, pulling out the drawers in my room and ripping the pillows apart, countless wing feathers scattering across the floor. <laughs> so finally, on the third night, I decided to call 911. Come on, come on, pick up. What's the matter with you? I don't have all day. Every second felt like an hour. So when an officer answered the call, I had never felt more relieved. Thanks for calling 911. How may I help you? The lady on the other end asked with authority and reverence. Um, yeah, well, uh, I'm Alvin and, um, you see, my parents have been missing, so, uh, for some odd reason, I couldn't get my head straight. Okay, sir. Take a deep breath and calm down. Kindly give me your location, please. I gave her my address and demanded that they step on it. Then when she confirmed if it was both parents, I yelled, Yes! All right, understood. Now, I need you to calm down as we dispatch police officers who will soon be headed your way. Am I clear? Stop telling me to calm down, for goodness sake! 
I fiercely replied, my hand shaking. I understand, sir, but I need you to promise me that you won't cause yourself any harm until the cops arrive. Can you do that for me? Yeah, 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 whatever. Just hurry up, will ya? Alright, thank you, Alvin. The police should be with you shortly. When the cops rang the doorbell, I instantly ran to the door and urged them to come in. Then, sitting on the couch, they asked me too many questions that made me feel like it wasn't getting us anywhere. Look, why don't you just go to the cabin like I told you, so we wouldn't be wasting any more time? Don't worry, sir, we're getting to that. We just need to gather all the necessary details before instructing our co-officers to search the cabin. But I already told you everything you need to know, so get on with it! Moments later, the cops went outside, contacting authorities on their radios. Then, with a look of bewilderment, they glanced at me, put down their radios, and headed back inside the house. So what did they say, officers? As of now, there's no sign of entry in the cabin, and the car you described was nowhere in sight. What? That can't be! They should have been there since the 4th of July! That's what they told me! I understand, sir. Our detectives are still at the cabin doing everything they can, so in the meantime, we'll have to search your house for any clues. Standard protocol. At that moment, I was both perplexed and furious, convinced that they could be making more progress if they went back to their car, tracing them. So I pulled one of them by the collar and said, No! What's wrong with you? Instead of wasting your time here, you should be out on the road searching for the evidence! Both officers looked at me suspiciously and coerced me to sit down as they proceeded to search the house. Moments later, one of them motioned to arrest me, to which I replied with a frown and knife in hand as I swung at them for self-defense. What's the meaning of this, officer? You've got the wrong guy! Then, someone hit me from behind and I dropped to the floor. So, in my semi-stupor, I could see investigators wearing gloves as they yanked out dismembered body parts from the travel bags they took from upstairs the look of terror in their eyes. Moments later, I drew a sinister grin and said, Hi, Dad. It looks like they finally found you. <laughs> However, to this day, my mother's whereabouts are unknown. Five, four, three, two, one. Happy Fourth of July! Hey! Dude, what the hell is wrong with you? It's three in the morning! I'm just rehearsing! <laughs>